Okay. Um, I'm going to stop that. I was trying to do something. I don't know how to do it. At any rate, our first presenter today is going to be Rita Gardner. Rita's a longtime member. She's a photographer, painter, and writer. And then we'll hear from Pat Oxberger, who's a new, or a new member, just joined this year. And her art includes photography, fiber arts, and now figurative drawing. So I'm going to unpin myself. And I'm going to unpin Pat. And we're going to have Rita. We're going to hear, hear from Rita Gardner now. OK. Shall I start speaking? <laughs> yeah, go ahead and share your screen and start speaking. Oh, OK. All right. Well, right now, the share the screen part is simply the introduction. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit about my background and then uh, start sharing some of the images. And as Irene said, I have three loves in my life besides my cat and my friends. And uh, that's art in various forms. Um, I've been painting and drawing ever since I was a small child. And photography also, not that early, but when I was probably in my 20s, my boyfriend gave me an actual real camera. And uh, so I've been playing with cameras off and on. And then finally, writing, which is also something I've done off and on from being a kid onward. So, but I'm not a uh, multitasker, so I kind of have to do one thing at a time. So for the first bunch of decades of my life, I mainly uh, did painting and drawing. And I'm gonna preface just for a real quick second to say that I had a fairly unconventional childhood in that my parents, um, we, we left the United States just after I was born and I never came to live in the States until I was um, 16, actually officially 18, but anyway. I went to school starting in 16. So I grew up on a coconut plantation, small farm actually, uh, in the Dominican Republic. And I had lots of time on my hands and art is what showed up for me to do. I was homeschooled, my sister and I were homeschooled. So we do that in the backyard, palapa with the lizards. And uh, but I had good friends and I had a lot of time. So my imagination ran wild. And I just started drawing pictures. And I even used the sand as my, the beach as my uh, palette. And I would get these uh, pointed kelp pens and use them to draw in the sand. And parents figured out that I liked art. And so they, First thing they did is they, I don't know where they found it because we were so far away from everywhere. Uh, they got me a paint by numbers set. And uh, that was exciting because <laughs> I could see what happens when you put little dabs of color here, there, and yonder, and then end up with a painting. Uh, so that was the first, first and only time I did that. And then I started just using, my father would give me like old boards or a cabinet door. So the first picture I'm gonna show Oops. Uh oh. Okay. So this is my problem. <laughs> I need to get these people out of the this position. So um, I can't. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't continue to show my slides unless I have. Uh, let me see. Hang on a second. Oh, okay. Here we go. Sorry about that. So here's a painting I did when I was 12 years old. Wow. Any artist in the room will know that the perspective is wildly off, but it's kind of what it looked like growing up there. And I had just discovered palette knife. So I, you can see I got rather carried away in the sky making the storm come in. And I 
I still have it. I don't know how it ever came to the States with me, but it's, uh, I have it here in my home still. And uh, it's just an example of kind of what it looked like down there. And uh, we had lots of hurricanes nearby. So storms were always something that we watched out for. Then after I came to the States and I moved to California, eventually my dear mother uh, moved out here in her 80s. And uh, some of my friends here know her well. And so this is a painting I did of her. I think she was probably about 80. And that's acrylic. Mm, nice. And then those of you who have lived in Point Richmond a very long time will know that this was Rosemary of Rosemary's Bakery, which was in the current location of El Sol. Mm, and, uh, wow. She moved away, sadly, and we've never had a bakery as good as that again. Yeah. So, um, this is an oil painting, and I it's oh. a clear painting, but I throw it in there because I just love what oil paint does on canvas. It's just so malleable and you can make so many changes before anything dries. And um, I love oil painting and yet it's such a mess. And I don't haven't really lived in too many places where I could just have a real messy studio. So then I moved to acrylic. Mm. And Sally DeWitt, who's watching, recognized this painting. It's of uh, Peter Conrad, who was a racing sailor. And he's also uh, was, I am correct in this, one of the co-owners of the sail making loft that took over when Jim DeWitt retired. Anyway, he was in town visiting and I just thought he was the most handsome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. So I painted him. Oh, shit. And... Thanks. Here we have uh, Jocelyn Nash, and Jocelyn Nash is also very well known as a racing sailor on the Bay and beyond. Uh, she was one of the first women that not only encouraged women to sail and race and be competitive, um, but she was a champion racer and she continued racing on her own boat and other people's boats I'm gonna say probably all the way up until about a year before she died and she died in her early nineties. Wow. She left a dynasty, her family, the, the Nash family, her, all her sons are sailors, all the grandkids are sailors. I mean, so the, there might even be great grandkids out there by now. But anyway, um, I think this kind of shows sort of her determination and grit. And yet she was just a most delightful human being as well. Wow. Oh. And this is my cousin's uh, granddaughter. And I was visiting her a few years ago. And my cousin kept talking about this little picture that she liked so much, this photograph. So one night I sneaked off and took a picture of the picture. <laughs> when I came home. I uh, did this as a, as a gift. I do like beaches. That is probably obvious. And uh, so this is a drawing that I did fairly recently. And a few years ago, I find I found myself wishing that I had the skills that I used to have with my hands for drawing and painting. And I felt that it had probably all gone by the wayside since I got into photography. And I really hadn't drawn any pictures or painted any pictures for about 15 years other than my cousin's little kid or something else along the way. So uh, my friend Pat Melandra showed me this picture of her, showed me a picture of her grandson, Sebastian. And it, to me, it just so spoke to the innocence of childhood and the wonder. And I, it just, it just impre uh, inspired me. And so this is a mixture of uh, colored pencils, watercolor pencils, and even pastels and I had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. And some of us know who this is. This is <laughs> Captain Biscuit. <laughs> Biscuit belongs to my friend Sylvia who's up there. <laughs> and uh 
he's a Yorkie and he's a wild and crazy little critter. <laughs> picture of him sitting on his mom's lap. So I took her out of the picture and did this drawing. Oh. And then uh, this is Cindy who's watching this. This is her son's dog, Bubba. And it was a birthday present for her son. And I had so much fun drawing Bubba. I had to take lots of pictures. She, because, you know, it's a dog. They don't really sit for you. <laughs> hmm. And last year, I started taking some online courses, um, drawing courses. And there was one course that I took called 30 draw, uh, let me see, 30 portraits in 30 days. And I did 30 portraits, but it took me about four months. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't do it every day. And luckily, they were all recorded. Uh, so I could go back and work on them anytime I wanted to. And this is ink on toned paper with a watercolor wash. Mm. It makes me want to learn more about watercolor, which I find um, might be difficult. And that may be what stopped me from really getting into it. But I love how watercolor looks. And this is another one that's also uh, ink on toned paper with a uh, watercolor wash to, you know, put in the details and the, the dark and lights and so forth. And now we're into photography. Mm -hmm. This lovely egret was over in Miller Knox Pond, right in our park nearby. And it was a foggy morning. So really what you see here is what I saw. There's no manipulation. I mm -hmm. used my uh, iPhone and it, I happened to have it on live and I didn't even know what live did. But what it does, it makes like a two second video. So I was somehow managed, and I don't know how I did it now, uh, to uh, have both of the images that I could see, one on top of each other. And that's the reflection of the uh, gray, gray sky above. Um, he was very graceful. And then we have another egret again. I used to walk into Point Richmond via the park. And so in the early morning to take some of Nancy Burns classes. So I would always go by the pond. And this one I took with my uh, actual camera, but it was a long ago, I gave up the big camera. And this is a Canon point and shoot. And the story to this one is that I got so excited taking this picture that I went back the next day that and uh, got very close to a bird and I kept getting closer and closer and I was getting closer to the pond and I slipped and fell in the mud and my camera flew into the mud and buried itself. Oh, oh no. <laughs> so that was the end of that camera. <laughs> and then we had the pandemic. And I put this pandemic up because uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Arts of Point Richmond and the photo group because we used to meet regularly in people's homes and look at pictures and critique and go on photo shoots together. And we just had this wonderful community. And then all of a sudden on March 17th, 2020, um, we had to pivot and stay home. But we soon got on Zoom, which was wonderful, and were able to continue a lot of our work online. And so I will move right along here. And this is one of uh, the pictures I like to call still life with masks. And if you look closely at them, you'll see it's the three kinds of masks that we all tried to figure out what the heck was going to work. <laughs> we have the medical mask over here. We have the N95 there. And then we have the one of many homemade masks that a bunch of us were, were busy making because we didn't know what to do. I thought that was a perfect pandemic art. And this is a, um, a tree that's right up on the hill here on the ridge line of Miller Knox Park. And this was taken at dawn. And one of the things that I started playing with in the last few years was uh, an app for the iPhone called Discussed Effects, which has a slew of, of layers that you could put on a picture to see how it looked. 
differently. And so this particular one I, I chose because it just kind of gives a sense of uh, dawn, but still kind of foreboding. And I really liked how it came out. It's a thin line between art and, you know, AI, but that's another conversation. And this one is uh, one of the, during COVID, the Arts of Point Richmond Photo Group did get on the ferry and we went to San Francisco and we went around Salesforce Park, which is, if you haven't been there, it's about four stories above ground with beautiful plantings from all over the world. It's really worth going to and it's very easy to get to. Um, but what it also afforded was the opportunity to look at these buildings at really odd angles. And I use this, uh, I use that app to kind of get the sort of misty, strange background to, it just felt like it made it a little more interesting. And anybody who's around Point Richmond knows that in the summertime we get, luckily, or in our, on our hillsides, um, eating up all the dried grasses and everything that could be a fire fuel. And uh, so because a bunch of us hike up there a lot, this was one day when we just came across the sheep, a uh, sheep herder, goat herder, herder, and his dogs and, and all the goats. And this guy, our gal, was just looking straight at me. So I figured, well, you looking at me? I'm going to take a picture of you. And I used, again, one of those backgrounds. If you can tell, it's a little painterly. And then sometimes pictures just, <laughs> I went to my sink to wash my dishes and I had put soapy water in this cup to soak. And when I got there, actually when I got there, the eye on the left was also not yet popped. And I grabbed my phone, but before I could take the picture with it perfect, that left eye went boink <laughs> and, the, and the bubble broke. But I think he's very charming. <laughs> And here we have one of my favorite subjects. This is my cat, Leo, who likes to get himself into really strange positions. Why would you do that, one might ask. Well, it's a cat, what can you say? <laughs> what I like about this one besides the blues um, is that his head uh, fur is kind of the same sort of tan color as the uh, wall. And then the white curtains and his white other fur. I don't know. I just thought, I thought it made a nice composition. Yeah. And he managed to stay there quietly enough for me to get a couple of pictures. Okay. <laughs> this is another photograph of Biscuit the Yorkie. Now, the story about this picture is that he was lounging, as you can see, on a sheepskin rug. And after I took the picture, I realized what it reminded me of. And you have to be of a certain age to remember that there was a big hoorah years ago when Burt Reynolds posed for <laughs> cover of, I think it was Cosmo magazine. Yes. Naked yeah. except for strategically placed uh, hands and or sheepskin rugs. I call this biscuits <laughs> homage to Cosmo. <laughs> oh, it's funny. <sighs> and this picture is from this year. Uh, New Year's Day, my friend Cindy and I, thank you, Cindy, for inviting me, um, went to Drake's speech and very unexpectedly found out that there's all kinds of uh, elephant seals, males, I think, getting ready for uh, mating and birthing season. Females haven't shown up yet. So they were scattered all up and down the beach and you were not supposed to get near them. So we didn't. But we had a lovely morning and, and the water was, you know, this part of the beach was shallow. And I love the reflections of the water and the cliffs and the sky. And if it's familiar, it's because it's also up in Point Richmond as a banner from the Taking, out, taking It Outdoors uh, outdoor banner project. And it's over by the firehouse. Hmm. And again, I used... Um, the app that I like to play with um, 
just something to enhance the, I don't know, it feels a little more rugged mm -hmm. and otherworldly. This is the last of the photographs. Um, this was taken just a couple weeks ago on a trail in Marin County called Yolanda Trail. It was an early foggy morning. And I just love the, the darks and lights and then the path leading off to wherever the path is leading us to. And everybody else was ahead of me. So I managed to get this quiet scene. So that's it for that. And then I, lastly, um, I do want to mention my other love, which is writing. And as I mentioned, I've done a lot of uh, submissions and into a lot of different kinds of publications over the years. But this is my very first and only book, Coconut Latitudes, Secrets, Storms, and Survival in the Caribbean. It's a memoir about my family's life growing up on the coconut farm and there was a lot of there were a lot of secrets there were a lot of storms and sometimes it felt like survival and if I can put a plug in for myself uh, I do want to say that it's won some national awards and is available for ordering from any book scores, bleh, bookstore um, and it's also on uh, Amazon as Kindle and as an audiobook and last of all, these are some of the other books that I have been um, privileged to be able to submit essays to. And the one here on the far my right, in the time of unbearable crisis, uh, the piece that I wrote about had to do with how during the pandemic, our group of local friends found community, joy, and freedom out on the trails on hikes where we started out six feet apart, mat, fully masked. And then as the years, uh, the, the last few years have you know dwindled in terms of danger of COVID, we're still doing it. And uh, I'm really happy that that was in there. So mm -hmm. that's it for my show and tell, I will stop share. And I don't know if there's any time left for any questions, but if there are, happy to answer them. <laughs> Great. Just wonderful. Thank you. Can we, can you hear me, Rita? Yes. Okay. I, I'm really impressed with your art. I didn't know you were so talented, but I think your art is, is beautiful. Did you have formal instruction or is it something you just picked up and developed on your own yeah thanks for the question definitely picked up on my own I, I i will tell a very short story in that when i was in high school we had a french uh, art teacher who i adored i was part of the dorky kids that were in art club not the popular kids and uh he actually was uh going to bat to provide to find out how I could get a scholarship to go study art in France. Um, and so I happily wrote my parents and told them this fabulous news. And uh, they wrote back and said, sorry, you're, you're not really talented enough and you really need to come home. So this that was a, it was a blow, but it did not stop me from continuously from then on. I just wish that I had maybe had the opportunity to do that. But no, I, I self-taught. Um, I've taken a few art classes hither and yon, but um, nothing formal, not, not in college. Um, just self-taught. Thanks, Carol. Did you find that was your real passion, was art? I always, somehow or another, I can't imagine art not being in my life ever, even when I was a kid. So. It just seemed to be part of me. You know, often I think it was an escape, but escape or not, it was uh, what I love to do. Well, very beautiful, very lovely, and very so multimedia talent. That's great, Rita. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. Okay, do we have any more questions before we move on? 
Okay. Then uh, let me see. Um, I have to do this. <laughs> All right. I'm going to pin. All right. Um, at this point, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Pat Oxberger. And um, again, I'm going to ask you to, un to mute yourselves while we're recording. So now we'll listen to Pat. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to see if I can get my um, screen to share here. Okay. How did we figure out to make that thing work, Irene? <laughs> um, Pat, double click on uh, on your uh, slide number one on the left, up there. Double click. I did. Okay, that didn't do it. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, I don't want to waste a whole lot of time. Um, let me try one more thing. We had it working, but of course it never works when you want it to. It only works when you're doing it on your own. Yeah. So um, anyway, so can people see that? I don't know how to, how, Rita, how did you get yours to just take over the full screen? Hi, what I, what I had to do is I had to um change the screen so I didn't see everybody all the little uh because there's an arrow probably somewhere you just I know and it disappeared now the next where's the arrow well it was on uh in my case uh it was on the right side of the screen right at the edge you might just be able to go straight to number two with it you're just do it that way I'm just gonna have to go this way and I'm, I'm sorry yeah not working the way I want it to, but that's kind of par for the course. Anyway, um, I've always wanted to be a painter, but I didn't start painting until three years ago. So it's always been a dream of mine. I think everything I've ever done in my career, in my life as an artist has been with hopes that I was painting, but I always felt, you know, it's like, not enough time, not enough money, not enough, you know, I had ki three kids, you know, never enough time or space for oil painting, although it was my dream. So instead, I did photography, fibers, um, I did a quilted, I was weaving, um, but I've been making things my whole life, kind of like you, Rita, it's just I can't imagine not being a maker of some sort. Um, you know, as a child, I was always creating, inventing, you know, just imagining. And I can, I thank my mother a lot for that. And I just, I'll show you later. I have an exhibit that's up at um, Point Reyes Station in at Gallery Route 1. And I've kind of, I kind of dedicated, I dedicated that show to my mother because she was the one that really taught us to be creative have a sense of wonder, be curious. I think curiosity was the biggest thing I learned from her. And I just honor that to this day because without that curiosity, I don't think I would have survived or I wouldn't be the artist that I am. Um, she grew up in a very conservative Mennonite. My family's Mennonite, so very conservative background. And mine was started out that way and then it loosened up. So you know, you weren't supposed to wear fancy dresses, you weren't supposed to go to classical music or the opera or dance or, you know, anything like that. But she managed to kind of introduce that stuff, those kind of things to us anyway. And I always like to tell the story that my sister and I listened to the opera when we were very young. And our favorite opera was, I always forget the name of it, but it's a um, Rigoletto. Bella Figlia dell'Amore, and we listened to this quartet with our Barbie and Ken dolls. And of course, we had to make the clothing for these dolls that was opera appropriate. So um, then I, that's how I learned to sew, is making clothing for my dolls. And that was kind of the beginning of my 
fibers career and I really was into making clothing and I went to fashion design school and you know just always was sewing and then I was quilting and then I went from quilting to crocheting and weaving and um, just and quilting was really a big part of my upbringing as a Mennonite you know and I fought it for a while because all good Mennonite girls know how to quilt and I was like I'm not going to learn how to quilt um, so, but I did anyway, later on in life, but, um, so I did, so when I went to college, I walked into a dark room. So then I discovered photography and then everything else just kind of went out the window. Um, so I, well, here, I'm going to show you some of my fiber art pieces. I kind of forget I have these slides. So these were later pieces I did because all the time I was doing photography, I started to do it as a business. So I didn't really think of myself as an artist photographer, even though I went to art school photography. I just kind of thought of it as a, I'm not sure. Um, well, so back when I went to school, photography was still not considered a fine art. There was always some question about whether it was a fine art, you know, Painting and things and sculpting was a fine art. Photography was journalism or something like that. So I never, I still never considered myself an artist. But so I did photography. I had a, a portrait business. I worked as a journalist photographer for a couple of newspapers. Mm -hmm. And all the while I was doing that, I was still doing fiber arts. I was still weaving. I was still quilting. I was still sewing because that was just kind of my survival. Um, <laughs> then when I went um, on to grad school, I started to combine the fibers and the photography a little bit. And I really don't have any photos of that, but I would crochet on top of photographs. Ooh. But here I want to um, show a few of the weaving projects that I did because in the introduction, you talked about my traveling, and that was part of what has influenced me so much in everything I've done is that I've been fortunate enough to travel around the world at least once and gone to many, many places. And all of that has really influenced everything I've done. And this is a project I did for the UN, which is when they started the um, permanent forum for indigenous peoples um, at the UN. And I did an exhibit there on textiles from all the different indigenous peoples around the world. And we had four quilts. These are about, I don't know, eight feet by eight feet. And they were exhibited in the in UN in New York. And this is just one of them. Um, then I also did a commission for a women's health center in Virginia using saris. So I really like to integrate wow fibers from different cultures. Um, my thesis in grad school was around a, a fabric called the conga, which is a worn piece of fabric in East Africa, and it has a message on it. And that's what this piece is made from. They're all East African congas. And this is a weaving I did for a Kenyan artist who told stories. And this piece is probably about 12 feet tall and it hung on the stage behind her as she told a story. And it was also an interactive piece because I put beads and little discs that made sound when you hit the piece. So as she talked, if she wanted some sound effects for her story, she would like tap on the piece and it would make sound. You can um, see a little bit right here where some of the um, some of the jewelry is that made the pieces that made sound. So all of the fiber pieces, as I got older, the fiber pieces that I did in, uh, were incorporating um, fabrics that I had been exposed to within my travels. Now, the, the, and this piece with the saris is called Grateful Saris, um, little play on words there. Mm -hmm. um, and this is how it was, this is just one of the pieces here. And then um, in, when it's actually displayed in the Women's Health Center, it's three of those circles up on the wall. Um, then I got into crocheting a lot and I was crocheting um, 
other pieces of art. And so this is, I don't know if you can tell, but it's called Screamish. So it's from Monks, the Scream. Wow. <laughs> and it's a piece that's probably about three feet by six feet. Um, it's a crocheted piece. So um, then I did some visiting artists where I got, really got into weaving and I was doing this human loom, we called it, where I would set up, um, I don't even know how you call it, like long strands to be the warp, which is the, the what goes this way. And I would hook them on one end and on the other end, you'd have people and they would lift them up and down like this. And then other people, as you can see here, would put the weft through. And so it, we called it a piece in process because it, people would come together to create this large piece. It ended up being about 13 feet long. And then it was displayed at the university where I did this. And here's um, an, a piece of there at the end. And people brought things that were kind of interesting to them. You see this guy worked for um, the Red Cross. So he brought um, a shirt from the Red Cross and people brought sayings, there's paper put in there. Um, people bought scarves that had, you know, meaning to them. And then here is little kids were helping put the pieces through, as you can see with the warp, some is up and some is down. And um, I've done that a number of times and it's really, I love creating community mm -hmm. art pieces where people work together. Um, and here is a some of my photography that I did, I'm kind of going back and forth here, so I'm sorry, I'm not very linear. Um, so when I was doing photography, here are some of my photographs. And this is when I actually was incorporating um, some fibers with my photographs. So you can see I did a little crochet piece down here with some flowers, and then I kind of wrapped fibers around the outside. And this was in my travels to Japan. This is um, a photograph of my mother. Um, this is the Berkeley Marina. No, oh, nice. But um, then I came to painting. My dream finally came true. And that was three and a half years ago. I decided it's now or never. I was 60, whatever, 60 some years old. And I decided, if I'm not going to, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it now. So I fortunately had one of my best friends, and I think it's part of why I wanted to paint is because she was, she's been painting for 50 years. She's just like a truly gifted and classically trained painter. So she knows everything about it. So I said, okay, now you got to teach me how to paint. And fortunately, she was the kind of person that we sat down and she gave me 101. You know, I had to start with the brushes, the oils, the mediums. I mean, I knew nothing, basically. And she was very graciously. But this is one thing I just wanted to share as an artist that I felt was one of the most important things that I've learned from her over these three years. I mean, even now, I'll call her late at night I'm going I'm going crazy I can't do this painting and she'll like just keep going don't stop just keep painting just put that paintbrush on the canvas and just keep on going um, but this process of slow looking and as an artist I find it really really helpful because I'm a fast painter and we'll get to some of my paintings soon um, and oftentimes I'll paint and I'll go oh that looks good I'm surprised I painted that I'm done and I'll show it to her and she go no, I don't think you're quite done yet. Take it, she said, take it to bed with you, take it to breakfast with you, take it everywhere you go around the house and just sit and look. And I'll read this to you. And I don't know if, if you guys can read it or not, but her, mm -hmm. her um, philosophy is that slow looking, eventually it evolves into a painting that tells me something about myself that I didn't already know and moves me in a direction much more interesting than where I thought I was going. When this starts to happen, I experience the most wonderful sensation of becoming the medium rather than the author of the work. The painting starts to direct me rather than the other way around. This is a truly heady sensation, one that more than any other other 
more than any other feeds my soul and gives me the reason to paint. In order to be willing to spend time just looking, I have had to develop faith that the process will work. And that faith gives me the tenacity and the patience I need to sit and simply look, no matter how long it takes for the muse to speak. And that has, I don't know, just helped me so much. And anyway, I just, I really honor her. Her name is Cinda Valle. And I was talking about her at my art show. And then I, I realized I never said her name. <laughs> <laughs> You know, how she said, well, you better go back and do that one again. So these, so my painting career started three and a half years ago. Some of my influences, and these are paintings I did, you know, one of the things I did was copy other painters that I really honored and loved. And I found that a wonderful way to learn and to teach myself. So this was an this is an Edward Monk, Edvard Monk. Mm -hmm. This is a Diebenkorn. Oh. And this is an Alice Neal. And oh. basically I copied them right out of the book, but I did it. I mean, I just looked, you know. They are not Alice, it's not Alice Neal, it's not Diebenkorn, it's not Edvard Monk, but it's my interpretation. And it helped me learn so much about brushwork. I mean, I still have so much more to learn. So just to show you where I started, and then I'll show you where I've ended up. So three and a half years ago, I started by doing landscapes. Hmm. And so this is one of my first landscapes I did up in American Canyon. Hmm. This is in West Virginia. This is in West Virginia. And then like I said, excuse me, um, I have a show, a solo show at Endpoint Rays, and that is what I would consider my new work because I, I kind of joke that I, you know, a lot of artists go through their stages, you know, like Picasso had his blue period and his cubism period and all these different periods. And I'm like, I have them too, but mine only last a month because I have to like kind of crunch my, my career really fast because I don't have that many years left. So um, this was my landscape period. <laughs> and now I'm moving on to go back to my true love, which is painting people. And that's why I did photography. And that's why I think all my fiber art, although I loved it, I never felt the connection to it because I really love, I mean, I like Alice Neal's saying of, I'm a collector of souls. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I photograph people and when I paint them, it's, it's just a closeness. Fibers are great, but with photography and painting, it's just collecting all these and getting to know all these people. So my show that's up now is, is in honor of my mother. It's the painting I did of my mother at her wedding. And because she was Mennonite, um, she was a little risque. My mother always was. She had these little tulip sleeves. You see them right here? That was not a very Mennonite thing to do. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is uh, my interpret my interpretation of her on her wedding day. And I, um, I did dedicate this exhibit to her and it was called Time of Wonder because one of the books she read to us as children was Robert McCloskey's Time of Wonder, which is just a wonderful book about children playing on the sand and the storm and just that creativity, curiosity, exploration, which I honor her so much for. I have a video here, which I am going to play, but I'm going to go through it fast because it's a little long, but it's a video going through the ex exhibit up in Point Reyes because it will show you my current work. Um, so let's see if I can get it to play and I'm going to Oh dear. Okay. Welcome okay. to Time of Wonder at Gallery you know, Woman in Point Reyes Station. My name is Pat Augsburger. Thank you for coming and I hope you enjoy the show. You know, it might not let me fast forward now that I'm doing it this way. Anyway, I'm gonna let you see take a look at my work. 
and I'll talk a little bit while we're showing it. Um, I paint people, I love to paint people, but I also like to really play with their environment and the background and see if I can get some sort of synergy or just something that not only a visual work together, but as also that works together with their personality and what they're doing. Now each, a name of each piece comes from a saying or a phrase from the book, Time of Wonder, this children's book. So half a whisper is a phrase from that book, but I felt it went with this painting of, um, she's actually my sister's granddaughter. And I've really been experimenting with really loose, brushy, painterly backgrounds, but still depicting um, the people and still hopefully telling a story about the, the people that are in my paintings. Now, a lot of my subjects are my family. It's very easy. They're around. They don't always love it, being my subjects, but um, they are. This was an earlier work, which is a little bit more detailed than what I've been trying to do. But this was in France. This is my daughter. These two are my most favorite people to paint in the world. These are my grandchildren. They're six years old. They've left the building, so it's really quiet. They were upstairs playing. <laughs> the twin six-year-olds. I'm sorry, I've already seen this one, but I'm not able to advance the video at this moment. So you just see it again. This again is my daughter, and this was after, um, I think there were one of the firestorms, and she was out looking for life basically after the firestorms. Um, so when it says, where do hummingbirds go in a storm? I didn't depict the fact that it was a firestorm, um, but
And for better or for worse, I have become addicted to painting large. Causes a lot of practical problems, but like this one is 50 by 60, I think. Wow. Um, again, these bearded, this bearded guy you see repeatedly is my son. Read up in on yet? Mm -hmm. Okay. She was really good. So this painting is um, probably one of the biggest ones I've done. I don't know, it's maybe 60, 60 by 70, something like that. Um, and this was where I was really playing around with um, really abstract backgrounds. And Joan Mitchell was quite an influence of mine, um, just trying to be loose and expressive with the paintbrush and the colors in the background and hopefully still be able to tell a story with the individuals in the painting integrated into the background. New York, Brooklyn Bridge, it looks like. Yes, it's Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm sorry, I thought it was muted. <laughs> That's okay. Um, this is the last piece of the exhibition. Um, this is, again, a really strong influence by Joan Myth Mitchell for the background. Um, it's, I just love integrating and more abstract with more realistic, trying to play the two together. That's all I got. Um, so any questions? Uh, I was just gonna say that I like the, um, I think you're integrating really well and I keep seeing images of fab fabric or, or strings in addition to the painting, in the paintings. Well, so, for you, you oh, take a look. Pardon? Oh, I thought I heard somebody have another question. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's, I think at this time of life, it's just really nice to have all of the influences from the last 50 years, you know, to inform me in my painting. I find it really has helped me move a lot faster. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm so impressed, Pat, that that was a great 
presentation and so interesting your journey your journey and now doing your dream mm -hmm. uh yeah beautiful and i was just up at point race but i didn't realize you had your gallery uh showing up there i only went to toby's lifetimes i will never be bored again <laughs> <laughs> I love your style, Pat. It's um, integrating the um, abstract with the real is nice. such a, an interesting concept. It's just delightful. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It seems like you're having fun. I am having yeah. so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and my my dear friend who's been painting for 50 years and, you know, trying to, you know, make a living, she goes, this is work for me. And I'm like, oh, but I am just having a blast. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The joy of living. You, you indicated uh, earlier that you're uh, rushing to get into painting and, and, and speeding through it as quickly as you can. Um, do you have any idea how long you'll, how long before you'll, you'll spread out into another medium or something else? Because this is really beautiful. I love it. I don't have any desire. Like I said, I think I'll never learn everything there is to know about oil painting in the however yeah. many years I have left on the planet. I mean, I'm almost 70. So there's so much to learn. And that's why I don't think I'll ever be totally, I don't think I'll ever be bored with oil painting. I might play with like watercolor or something like that, but I love oils. Mm -hmm. They're just so luscious. It's just I don't know. Well, it, and well, it looks like you're having a How long have you been and... working with oil? How long have you been working with oil? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty impressive. I think you are an absolute wonderful <laughs> addition to the Arts of Point Richmond. Thank you for joining. Uh, thank you. I've, I've felt so welcome. It's just a wonderful group. It's just great. Thank you so much. I was so honored to be asked to do this. I couldn't believe it. It was really wonderful. Pat, you have um, on uh, the, in our exhibit here in Point Richmond Gallery, you have a, a one of your pictures that I hope everyone will go see because then they'll really see what your paintings are like. But tell us something about that one. Um, it's in the front. I don't know. She had it in, in the front. front window. Is it still there at the um, Point Richmond Gallery? Yeah. And it's been there since the Faces and Places exhibit was opened, and it will be there until June. 11th, I believe. Um, that painting is of my my mentor, my my darling Cinda Valle. And she's um, eccentric and a dreamer. And I loved her name is Cinderella. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and um, we call her name, we call her Cinda, but I, I spelled Cinderella. Her way, C Y N D, and it, you know, I took the picture first, and then all of a sudden, it just kind of came to me once I was doing the painting. I mean, there she is without shoes; she's kind of dreaming of what could be. Um, that it just seemed so fitting to call the painting Cinderella. Mm -hmm. um, but that was again was my my what I'm trying to do is a very abstract background and integrating her kind of floating in in the abstraction. Um, so yeah, go by and see it. I'd love to hear what anybody has to say about it. It was a really fun painting to do. And then again, it's quite large. It's like 65 by 40, I think. Can't wait to go out to um, Point Reyes to see that, that show. That's great. Oh, please. It's there until June 11th. Um, and the only yeah. days they're closed are, we're closed are Tuesday and Wednesdays. Okay, great. Thanks. So yeah, come on out. Um, the other fun thing, just practicality about um, painting large, is um, I need a bigger car. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really hard to say studio, but yes, you're right. Well, I you do need a bigger, need a bigger studio too, but I think I might have a better chance getting a bigger car, but maybe not. I mean, my, I'm looking at my husband's Mazda Miata sitting right out there in the front. <laughs> And I have a Chevy Bolt, but you know, you can also just rent vehicles. That's but, right. Um, yeah. yeah. Don't let that stop you. I won't let it stop me. One, <laughs> of, the, one of the things that uh, I really appreciated, like I felt really came through in your painting 
was this sense of of joy that I mean you're very you may be yeah. spending a lot of time with them it may be slow but the process for you is clearly full of joy mm -hmm. and and you convey that and and it kind of comes to the viewer through the painting and that's that's really a gift you don't always get that with a painting but I so I'm, I'm so glad that you are really in such close touch with your process that you're able to share that that vision that comes through so that's thank wonderful you. to hear thank you thank you I don't know am I on can you hear yeah. me yes oh, okay I'm just so inspired actually by the both of you about your journey and the creative, the breadth of your work and how it, and your life and how it totally integrated from one into the other to the other mm -hmm. and the quality that you bring to it and the enthusiasm. And it's just so inspiring. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And these presentations were just excellent. Thank you, Irene, for for doing this because it, it is really a treat and it really is quite successful, I think, yeah. of bringing us together and hearing um, about your work. I did see your painting in the gallery and I really love it. And so it's a delight to see you, who you are. Thank and you. Thank, thank you. you. Pleasure to meet you. <laughs> thank you. I I'm going to stop now. Um, Rita, uh, I think it was Judy Rat Ratner, who had a question about the iPhone app that you used uh, to make those backgrounds. Right. And it, it, uh, actually in the chat, somebody, uh, Carol Lepko answered, answered her question, but it's called, uh, the particular one that I use most is called Distressed, spelled out Distressed, mm -hmm. X, F, and X. Mm -hmm. Also in the chat, if somebody wants to uh, look it up. And I have another comment to make, and that is uh, Pat Osberg uh, was, I think, encouraged to join Arts of Point Richmond by Betsy, Betsy well, Kellis. Is that correct? <laughs> good. Yeah, I learned to know her through um, Point Ray's Gallery Round oh, 1. Right. She right. was there, and we met through that because I took over the job that she had as artist member coordinator. So we met quite a few times talking about that. And then she said, you yeah, know, because I live in Richmond, Point Reyes is a little ways away. So I'm like, I'd really like to be part of something in my community. And she said, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm so glad I did. This is really wonderful. So happy that uh, she talked you into it. Well, thank you both Rita and, and Pat. Um, it's truly been inspiring to see your journeys and thank you so much for sharing all that with us. Let's give them a big hand. Yay. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks thank everybody. You. And thanks Irene. It was wonderful. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thanks you guys. And I, I just have another thing to say and that is our next artist talks will be um, June the 17th with Kay Oliver, um, wildlife photographer, and Lenore Storms, who is presently showing her work in El Sol. And then we're going to have a, a little vacation until September, and then we'll resume in September. So that's it, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you all so much.